Hey everyone, John here from Learn to Stargaze and I'm excited because we've been sent two awesome pieces of gear and we're going to put them to the test. First, we've got this Ascar 103 triplet Apple chromatic telescope and a big shout out to All Star Telescope for lending me this scope. But this just arrived and I actually have to go to Dalhousie University to do a presentation, so we might as well take this with us and unbox it on campus. There you go, it's unboxed. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks All-Star All Telescope. Okay, I'm back and now we've got the ASI 2600 Duo, which comes direct from ZWO. Let's get this out of the box. USB cord. Here's a short USB cord for smaller telescopes. A really short USB cord in black. Another short USB cord. We've got an Allen wrench. Always need those. And here are the spacers. And then another tiny threaded adapter. Oh. As you can see, this is quite a lot bigger than the 294 MC Pro camera. Let's take a look at that sensor. Wow, that's big. Okay, here's the plan. We're gonna put these together, take some images of galaxies and nebula, and then I'll show you a relatively quick and easy way to process the raw images using Photoshop. But first, some background on why we're choosing to go in this direction. This resulted from a conversation I had with Nicholas from All Star Telescope. We were trying to come up with a system for folks leveling up their astrophotography in 2024 and have a budget of around 5,000 US dollars. We decided on this combination because we believe that this scope and camera combination is both robust and simple, yet relatively cost effective. Also, I want to let everyone know that although I'm loaning the scope from All Star and this camera did come direct from ZWO, my opinion of this gear is my own. Now in a previous video that I called starting big with a small telescope, I'd recommended this small refractor on a lightweight mount. This is what I've been using for astrophotography for the last two years. I can travel with it, I can set it up in less than three minutes, and it has been very reliable. Now this system costs about $3,000 to put together, and if this is where you feel you are in your astrophotography journey, check out that video, I'll post a link in the description. These little refractors are great for capturing large objects like the North American Nebula and the Andromeda Galaxy without having to do a mosaic. Going from 60 millimeters of aperture to over 100 millimeters of aperture is going to make a huge difference. So here was my previous astrophotography setup, which included this Explore Scientific EB-102. It also included an ASI 294MC Pro camera. And if I were to build a similar system today, I would do a few things differently. The main difference being that this particular telescope has gotten much more expensive. Now I paid 1,099 US dollars for this about six years ago. In 2024, this scope now has a list price of $2,499. As we'll see in a minute, the Ascar 103 is comparable, but is only 999 US dollars in 2024. The other major change I would make is to the camera. Now I love the ASI 294MC Pro for the price at 999 US dollars. It was a great introduction to the world of designated astronomy cameras. But this new camera, the ASI 2600MC Pro Duo, is apparently so good that it's hard to underestimate its advantages. It has a larger sensor with higher resolution and far less noise. Thus, by going with the 2600, we should be avoiding a lot of unforeseen problems, specifically with the calibration images. On top of that, with the Duo, you get the second camera for guiding. The second camera removes the need to have a guide scope and guide camera all together. Okay, so putting this together should be relatively straightforward. We'll put the telescope on the mount, put the field flattener on the camera, and that should be all there is to it. Now I'm gonna use the ASI Air, but you can plug the camera and the mount into a computer directly and use the image capture software of your choice. For the ASI Air, I think we're just gonna mount this to the bottom of the cradle. So if we pull the telescope out like this, let's give this a shot. I've got an L Enhance filter here for uh, taking images of nebula. Wow, that is so close. I'm guessing that's what this is for. Nope. <sighs> okay, we'll figure it out. All right, so it's a week later, hence the haircut. Anyway, I figured out what happened. This camera and the adapter has M54 threads. 
and my field flattener has M56 threads. So close that it looks like it should work. But if I were to buy this same generic flattener today, it would actually come with M48 threads, which would work with the adapter that came with the camera. Anyway, I called Nicholas at All Star Telescope and he sent me over the official 0.8 flattener reducer, which includes M48 threads. The M48 threads will thread into this adapter that came with the camera. All right, let's put it all together. Now, the first thing I'm gonna do is salvage the light pollution filter. This is an L Enhance filter from my old field flattener. We'll put that aside. We're gonna open up the focal reducer and the light pollution filter will drop right inside. And then we're gonna use a tiny screwdriver and there's little slots in the side and we're just gonna push it around so it slides into place very carefully. Okay, that's nice and snug. Now we're gonna add the adapter from the camera. And according to some of the other videos, like Nico's video, this can get stuck in there. So I'm not gonna tighten it too tight. And now we can thread the adapter from the field flattener into the two adapters from the camera. And let's thread this into the focal reducer. Remove the protective cap from the camera. All right, so one thing we need to think about is back focus. And that's why we needed both of these adapters. There needs to be 55 millimeters between the CCD, which is located at about this line here, and the base of the M48 thread here. Now, if we do the math, we can add it all up or we can just check it with some calipers. Just roughly, I can see, yeah, 54, 55, we're right there. To attach this to the telescope, we just unscrew this adapter here, take off the lens cap. Oh, that's hard on the ears. Oh man, that's horrible. Man. And we're gonna thread that into the telescope like this. <sighs> Success. All right, so I'm just gonna wire everything into the ASI Air and it's recognized the two cameras. According to Google, the focal length is 700 millimeters and we're gonna stop that down by 0 0.8, 700 times 0 0.8. Okay, 560. We will type in 560 for both the main scope and guide scope focal lengths. So for the mount, I'm choosing Skywatcher AZ GTI slash SynScan. Uh, that's actually my other mount, according to the internet. That's actually the best option for this mount as well. So 115200. All right, we're connected to the mount. You should write this number <laughs> in Sharpie on your mount because you will forget it and you will be struggling to connect to your mount in the middle of the night. On the base of the mount, 115200. All right, I have control of the mount and I can even take a short exposure. Let's take a one second exposure here with the camera. Okay, we should talk about this mount for a moment. This is the EQ6R Pro. This mount has a capacity of 44 pounds. Now I originally bought this mount with larger telescopes in mind. So this may be overkill for this setup. That said, the general rule of thumb is that you don't wanna go much over half of the mount's capacity for astrophotography. So in that case, 22 pounds. Well, this telescope weighs about 12 pounds. The camera weighs about 1.5 pounds. The field flattener, a pound. The ASI Air Mini, maybe half a pound. Anyway, with cabling and everything, we're probably coming in here at about 15 pounds. So given the 15 pound weight of all this gear, there are other mounts that might be less expensive than this EQ6R Pro that would work just as well. Here are some examples. The Skywatcher HEQ5 mount with a capacity of 30 pounds, the ZWO AM3 with a capacity of 29 pounds. Anyway, I'll put a link to both of those mounts in the description. So for a rough estimate and note that all these prices are as of January, 2024, and I'm also gonna use US dollars. Now this telescope currently costs $999. This mount, the EQ6R Pro, costs $2,025, and the camera costs $1,999. You also do need the field flattener. Now that generic one I had, that costs about 130 US dollars right now, and the official Ascar version costs $199. All right, but what about those alternative mounts that will definitely save you some money over and above the EQ6R Pro? The Skywatcher HEQ5 is currently $1,475.
were about $550 less than this EQ6R Pro. The ZWO AM3 with the tripod is about $1,800. Now in some of my older videos, you may have seen me using my Celestron AVX mount, and although that mount is a little cheaper, I found it to be a little bit too finicky for astrophotography. So all in from a cost standpoint, if you go with the HEQ5 mount, you may be able to squeeze everything in below 5,000 US dollars. Before we take this telescope outside at night, I need to take a moment to thank All Star Telescope for sponsoring this video. All Star has been sponsoring videos on Learn to Stargaze for over a year now, and since that time, they've grown considerably. It's now easier than ever to order products and have them shipped wherever you are, in the United States, in Canada, or around the world. Check them out by visiting their amazing website at allstartelescope.com. All right, so I am planning to take the telescope out tonight, but it might be a bit treacherous. We just had a snow and ice storm. Look at this. Our deck is solid ice. In other words, I don't think I'm gonna to try to take that telescope mount down the stairs. I'll try to set it up on the deck, which isn't perfect, but we'll do our best. Polar line. Now it's gonna rotate 60 degrees. All right, better than 81%. And maybe we'll do a quick stop at Beetlejuice to check our focus and make sure we have no cable snags. This. 0.2 seconds, save, and go. Okay, there's all 10 stacked. So I'm having this issue where it's taking forever to get the image from the ASI Air to the phone, except I've switched ASI Airs. This is another one and it's still quite slow. All right, I figured out the issue with the slow ASI Airs. The app on both devices got flipped off 5G onto 2.5G and that seemed to be the root cause. All right, so we've done everything we need to do to start taking exposures. Our guiding is pretty good. Well, I stepped on the deck, so I'll have to get off the deck before I actually start taking exposures, but we were at less than half an arc second of guiding, so the guider inside is working great. Uh, it's pointed at the horse head, which is uh, my most recent photo with my prior setup. And so let's take a photo of the horse head nebula and see how it compares. We've got just maybe 20 minutes before it goes uh, behind the house there, but we'll see how much we can do. Also, that street light, I think there's enough angle, it's not gonna be much of an issue. We're just gonna have to uh, hit it and see how we do. All right, we're gonna call it here for the night. We're about to hit the house with the telescope. Really cold out here. I wish I had to troubleshoot it, that issue with the 5G, 2.5G a little faster. That was kind of embarrassing, but now I know. So for next time. But anyway, we got 27 minutes of exposures and I think the image looks pretty good. So let's go inside, put it on the computer and do some quick processing. Here we've got our stacked image that we've downloaded from the ASI Air to the computer. And the first thing we need to do is turn this from a FITS file into a TIFF file so that it can be read by Photoshop. So I'm gonna use the free software GIMP to do that now. We're just gonna drag it into GIMP, hit this Naxos button. Not sure what that means, but it does uh, make sure that the image is in color. What we're gonna do here is just export this file as a TIFF file, keeping all the settings the same. Now we can take that TIFF file and open it in Photoshop. The first thing I'm gonna do is rotate this image just because I know that the uh, camera flips the image. The telescope flips the image. I'll flip that horizontally. Okay, so in terms of processing, I like to follow a five-step process. The first step is to adjust the levels. So what I'm gonna do here is just adjust these levels. That's uh, Apple or Control L for levels. Just isolating the histogram into this first quarter right here. So this is our histogram, here's the first quarter. Uh, just getting the data here by moving these sliders. Now I'm trying not to move the black slider uh, into the data, you would lose data there, but I don't think you lose any data by just moving it to the edge right here. 
So now that uh, we've, we can actually see our image, we realize that it's quite red. So step two is to go up to Filter, Camera Raw, and we need to align the colors using the curves in Camera Raw. We can align these colors so that the red is no longer dominant. So I'm adjusting the curves here and watching the histogram here. Okay, now that our colors are aligned, we're gonna go back, play with our levels and our curves again until the image looks pleasing to the eye. Now one thing you can do here in curves is hit Apple or Control, click on the black, click on the nebula, and then click on a bright star, and we can adjust the levels of the nebula up. All right, and after that's looking fairly good, we can go back into Camera Raw Filter for some final adjustments. We can play with our blacks. This is step four, by the way. I like to use this clarity button to really bring up those midtones right there. Bring up that nebula. And once you're happy with the image, it's you can see that it's still quite noisy. What we can do here is use this denoise function to get rid of some of that noise. Again, there's still gonna be some noise because we only have 24 minutes of exposure. And if we use too much, it starts to look like an oil painting. So you sort of wanna use just the minimum amount so that you don't lose your stars as well. All right, so that's starting to look fairly good. Of course, you could, you could play with this all day, um, but that's not bad, right? There's some other paid software that does a better job at denoising than Photoshop. So if we wanna use that, we can save this image we can save it as 4D noise, open the image in Topaz, and then given the default settings, we can get rid of quite a bit of that noise while still maintaining our stars. And hypothetically, you can drop this back into Photoshop for some final tweaks. There we go. These last few weeks were filled with not one, not two, but three huge snowstorms. During the filming of this video, we couldn't access our dark sky location. There's simply too much snow. But this won't be the last time you see this setup on this channel. I've had the telescope for about a month now, and I do feel like I've given it a pretty thorough test. Now, I still consider myself a beginner astrophotographer. Nico Carver, Trevor Jones, and Queen the Lazy Geek, they are the real experts in this space. So if you want to take your imaging and image processing to the next level, check out their amazing channels. As for the 2600 Duo and the Oscar 103, I'm extremely impressed by this pairing. The guiding was fantastic, the images seemed flawless right up to the edges. The only issue I had besides my old field flattener that didn't fit was the ASI Air. For some reason, when I turn it on, it was defaulting to a Wi-Fi frequency of 2.4 GHz instead of 5 GHz that issue actually caused me to lose an entire hour of clear skies while troubleshooting. Although as anyone that is experienced in astrophotography can tell you, troubleshooting problems is a huge part of this hobby. Anyway, the quality of this setup over my old setup is significant, so much so that I'm gonna ask Nicholas at All Star Telescope if I can simply buy this telescope from him. This camera pairs so well with this telescope that I simply can't give it back. Now going back to my old camera, I said that I liked the 294 MC Pro, but I constantly struggled with different types of noise that the calibration frames never seemed to fully eliminate. This includes hot pixels that should have been taken out with the bias frames, although Nico Carver has a great short video on how to deal with that. There was also banding in the images, what I believe is called walking noise. Even with dithering, it was still noticeable in many of the images with my old setup. Finally, due to the weather here in Atlantic Canada, I often pack up early due to clouds, forcing me to rely on denoise software like Camera Raw in Photoshop or Topaz denoise. Now, shooting with the new 2600MC, 
The differences were immediately apparent. There was no sign of either walking noise or any hot pixels. The only noise I had to deal with was a result of my inability to collect several hours of data. This horsehead nebula was just 24 minutes, and this image of the rosette was an hour. I think most experienced astrophotographers can look at these two images and tell that they were denoised quite a bit, but I think they still look pretty good. To comment on the guiding with the duo, I was getting about half an arc second of precision, so nothing to complain about there. But one of the challenges I had, which may just be user error, is that I had to turn the gain way up to see the stars on the screen so that I could focus. One reason for this could be that the sensor is so far off to the side of the focal plane that it's effectively caught in the scope's natural vignette. One thing I had to watch with the telescope was the focus. I didn't attach any electronic focuser, I just relied on a Batnoff mask. Taking the scope from inside a warm house to a minus 10 degree backyard, I didn't have time to let it cool down before starting the image, so I found I did need to adjust the focus between targets. Now I had no issues with frost or dew. This may be due in part to the dryness of the winter air or that I'm currently in a city. I do have a USB dew heater on hand and this camera actually includes a built-in dew heater as well. And just looking at some more results here, here's a six minute exposure of the Orion Nebula and here's about 30 minutes on the California Nebula. As you can see, I had to use a lot of denoising, but you can still tell that the camera is capturing an incredible level of detail. That will only get better with exposure time and darker skies. Now, I did attempt to image some galaxies, but I really didn't get a clear shot. And I also should have removed the L-Enhance filter. This exposure of M33 was taken with the telescope pointed just above a light on the neighbor's house, and this image of M81 and M82 was taken through a tree. Although this is kind of funny, I used this new Graxpert software to remove the tree branch, and I was actually surprised how well it did. I'll try again to shoot galaxies once I get this telescope to dark skies. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video on the Asgar 103 telescope paired with the ZWO 2600 MC Pro Duo. Thanks again to All Star Telescope for sponsoring this video, and remember, the future is looking up.